Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, very good evening, uh, all of you. Warm uh, welcome. On behalf of the Civil Engineering Section Committee of the Institution of Engineers Sri Lanka, you are warmly welcome to the webinar that will be discussed on impact of COVID-19 on construction and infrastructure development and the path to recover and its progress. Ladies and gentlemen, the Institution of Engineers Sri Lanka is the apex national body for professional engineers in the country. Just brief of the purpose, uh, as the international and local responses toward the COVID-19 pandemic continues to develop, we know that capital projects, infrastructure owners and stakeholders are faced with potentially significant challenges to which they need to respond rapidly. More broadly, we have to reassess re projects at different stages, project under procurement, project under construction, and assets in operations. We as ISL also called the process from our engineers, and today's webinar will support us to get the clear idea and picture on updated status of this path to recovery and its progress. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have here with us uh, six resource personnel. Please join me in welcoming all of them first. We have today uh, engineer Professor Ranjit Disanayaka, he is the Chartered Engineer and Fellow in, of the Institution of Engineers Sri Lanka and the Chairman of the Civil Engineer Section Committee of the Institution of Engineers Sri Lanka, the Senior Hello. Professor of Civil Engineering at Hello. University of Peradeniya, Fellow of the International Institution Institute for Infrastructure, Renewal and Reconstruction, member of the Society of Structure Engineers Sri Lanka, and the Chairman, Green Building Council of Sri Lanka. Then we have uh, Dr. Kamal, engineer Dr. Kamal Laksiri. He has 20 years experiences in hydropower and dam engineering, Vice President, the Institution of Engineers Sri Lanka, member of the Strategic Council in International Water, Water Association, past president, Association of Consulting Engineers Sri Lanka, executive committee member, PIDIC Asia Pacific Group, Vice President Sri Lanka National Committee of Large Dam, Chairman Sri Lanka Association of the Institution of Civil Engineers UK, and the Chairman of Water Forum, the Institution of Engineers Sri Lanka. Then we have Engineer Malit Mendis, is a Chartered Civil Engineer, Chairman and the Chief Executive Officer of Mendis Cabin Consultants Private Limited, Sri Lanka Country Representative, Institution of Civil Engineers UK. Sri Lanka Country Representative, Dispute Resolutions Board, Fa Board Foundation, FIDIC Accredited Trainer, Lecturer in Construction Contracts, Arbitrator and Adjudicator, Member, Capacity Building Committee of the International Federation of Consulting Engineers. Then we have Engineer Rohan Tudave, uh, then he's a Chairman and Managing Director of Tudawi Brothers Private Limited and Chartered Civil Engineer. Well experienced in handling major construction projects both overseas and Sri Lanka. He has the past chairman, is the past chairman of the Board of National Consultant Association. He has served the International Federation of Asian and Western Pacific Contractors Association. He has served as the chairman of the Civil Engineering Sectional Committee and a council member of the Institution of Engineers Sri Lanka. Engineer, Colonel Nishanka Vijayaratna is Secretary General, Chief Executive Officer, Chamber of Construction, Industry of Sri Lanka, Home Secretary to Minister of Housing and Construction. Then we have Major Captain Kularadna. So Captain Kularadna is founder and the visionary of MAGA Engineering, a fellow of the Institution of Certified Professionals Manager and the Institute of Chartered Business Administra Administrations. Kula Ratna is the current chairman of the major and specialized construction of Sri Lanka and apex body of the country's major construction companies. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we wish to invite all of you today to uh, join with this uh, webinar organized by the Civil Engineering Sectional Committee. And I wish to invite today the moderator, engineer Dr. Kamal Laksiri, to present the webinar. Dr. Kamal Laksiri, over to you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good, good evening to all of you and welcome to this uh, webinar organized by the Civil Engineering Sectional Committee of IESL. Good evening uh, to you. Yeah. Thank good you. Evening. Uh, good evening. 
Yeah, thank you. Good, good evening. And thank you, Manjula and Prasanna, for the excellent arrangement for this seminar. And we have about uh, 300 registered, and, and I hope the others will soon. And the large number also shows the. Uh, Manjula, if you can. Yeah, the the topic today is the the impact of COVID nineteen on construction and infrastructure development, part two, recovery and progress. Very important topic and timely topic. <coughs> they are selected. Uh, as we all know, the recently exper experienced COVID nineteen pandemic has changed the whole world scenery within a very short. Still. We are was in a, another forum there the health authorities conducted they are they are they were talking about the possibility of second and third waves as well so still we are not out of danger but still it's right time to talk about the impacts of covid-19 i think uh, the negative impacts of covid-19 to most of the sectors are very much damaging and our industry that is construction industries among the is no exemption and is top of the affected sectors list and uh, we also know that our construction industry represents about 10% uh, of gdp but already suffering due to various uh, other reasons even before covid-19 so now with covid-19 the situation situation has gone from bad to worst so therefore, I think, uh, as the title suggests, the uh, the idea of this webinar today is to have a look into the impacts and and to look at the uh, way forward, the path to recovery. Uh, to discuss this important topic, we have invited to the veterans in the industry, construction industry. I think uh, Manjula a little while ago gave a formal introduction, but they most of them, uh, all of them, are veterans in the industry and well known to all of us, and no need of uh, introductions. Uh, so let me uh, now, the panel actually, uh, the consists of uh, Engineer Professor Ranjit Disanayaka, Engineer Colonel Nishanka Vijayaratna, Engineer Major Ranjit Dunitlak, I think he will join us soon. And then Engineer Rohan Tudave, Captain MG Kularatna, and Engineer Malit Mendis. Uh, we were also planning to get the Chairman Sida, Professor Sohan uh, Vijay Seger, but unfortunately due to an, another appointment today, uh, he could not join us. So then let me th thank one more time the panelists for accepting our invitation and joining amidst their busy schedules because we arranged this seminar in a very short time and so thank you again for joining us. Now let's uh, look at the discussion. Now in this, this discussion I would like to go in two rounds and the, then the uh, with uh, the to conclude with the Q and A session, I am very sure you all will have lots of questions. So in the first round, I think uh, each of you will get uh, eight minutes, and they are yes. to uh, focus on the background background of the current issues with the construction industry, and then in the second round we can uh, we'll discuss about the path to recovery and the progress made. And for that also, uh, we can give you each uh, eight minutes. Then at the end, uh, we will take up the interesting, uh, all your important questions and, and we'll answer you. And I kindly request you to use the chat box facility. Uh, you can uh, forward all your questions through the chat facility, because otherwise it's a bit difficult for us to accommodate all the questions. And then with uh, that, we will uh, direct to the, uh, different uh, speaker resource persons. And you can also mention if you want to uh, direct any particular question to any particular speaker. So kindly use the chat facility and then uh, we'll arrange the, uh, for the answer in the Q&A session. Then to uh, uh, start the... Dr. Lakshi, uh, just uh, with, uh, that, uh, please use my name, Manjula Samarthinga, for any, uh, all the questions, uh, please put my uh, yeah okay manjula yeah yes then i will raise that one. yes yeah you can put in the chat box you can select uh, manjula summer singh and uh, type your question there <laughs> so then uh, let me start the panel discussion i would like to start with professor ranjit disanayaka the chairman civil engineering sectional committee and the senior professor university of Murtua. so 
uh, as the chairman of the civil engineers technical committee chair i would like to get an introduction and importance of this topic today why we need to discuss and uh, the and, and the, the, the especially considering the, the the importance of the topic can you just uh, give us a brief uh, introduction uh thank you dr laksiri good evening everybody uh mr manjula thank you very much for the whole organization and the uh, for the whole panelists for coming to our session on the, the topic on construction present situation today let me start uh, this way uh, the number of professionals in all in the construction industry in sri lanka uh, more than 10000 then uh, all the companies, if I get from the uh, different uh, grading and whatever may be, and then including the manufacturers and various other, nearly 2,000 companies are involved in the construction industry, more either directly or indirectly. But when you go to the as a GDP, as even the Dr. Luxury mentioned, it's go even up to um, eight to 10% of the GDP. That may explain in the, this is a huge industry. When you go to the employment, uh, there are nearly 6,500 or more directly employed in the construction industry. And there are another 300,000 or more indirectly, but they are basically supporting the construction industry. Then uh, you understand the huge industry, there are over a million people I know, and uh, 10,000 professionals and uh, 2,000 companies. So this is one of the biggest industry that we have in, uh, in the country. When you compare the, when you go to the developing country, construction industry, a huge role, it is uh, development. Therefore, as we know that Sri Lanka is a developing country, this is uh, a very important industry in terms of development of the country. Then uh, when you go back to what has happened during last uh, almost like uh, two, three years, it suffered a lot. Uh, of course, the last year bomb uh, made the huge uh, impact on the construction industry. But even before also, uh, construction industry was not uh, doing very well. Uh, then uh, uh, actually during last, uh, yes, as the construction industry was not doing very well. We were not the, we were not paid, and so for the for the time being, I think part of the payment has been paid. But uh, basically, over hundred billion rupees to be paid to the construction companies and so forth. You can understand that there is no security of the job in the market. And the payment are not coming into the contractors uh, amount of the people employed and how it is suffered. Now, this is the, uh, the when you go to the COVID-19, it is uh, just uh, either lockdown or curfew, whatever it is, just left as it is. Then a country like uh, Sri Lanka, we have been 100% oh, I mean the fairly big amount is uh, depend on the import of the construction material and so we not only import the material some of you may know that we import the laborers as well as you know before the covid i think uh, we are bringing like the almost 500 laborers out of the country and the, we have as a country we don't have the proper plan for the sustainability of the material that is has been so you may have heard that the construction cost in Sri Lanka, the one of the highest in the Southeast Asia, it's second to the only the Singapore. Why it is so? So how can we develop the country if we are, have to spend that much for the construction? Why we are the highest? What is the reason? We can talk about the different angle. Let me start in the one direction, like the um, material like sand. You, I don't have to say that. how much the price is like the this is uh, like the 18,000 or so forth for the 2.7 meter cube per meter. Right? Then we, we, when you calculate the amount of the sand required, so we cannot get it from the river sand. So we have to go for the different option. As a country, 
is there a sustainable way of taking this raw material now likewise we import lot on the import material for the construction and the lot of taxes and that kind of thing finally the pig has become the second larger largest uh, on the for the when you go to the construction in the mm -hmm. southeast asia so therefore not only after the covid 19 of course covid 19 Brought a lot of challenges, but uh, we have to make sure that uh, these challenges should, should convert into the opportunities. We have to think about the producing our own material, thinking in a sustainable way, waste recycling, modular construction. Likewise, there are many methods that we can adapt. So this is the right time as an industry. Uh, we have to think about the, this kind of new way of doing things. So this is the what I think importance. Let me. summarize what i want to say is i highlighted the amount of the professionals and the companies in all in the construction business is a huge and i explain again about the how about the contribution to the uh, from the gdp it is like a 8 to 10% then nearly million people are either directly or indirectly employed in this construction business then again uh having this much a big industry during the uh, last 2 3 years uh, not having the payment as well as uh, because of the covid push of the country we don't get the supply into the, and the labor is and again we have end up with the uh, one of the highest the rate for the scapito whatever so that then we have to now covid has come we as a industry uh, and being the professionals we have to think back make sure that this is not a challenge but we have to make it as the opportunity we have we have to produce most of the material in the country we have to understand the where are the material shortages there we have to make sure that the such a shortage is how we can overcome then we have to come up with the new method and methodology like the modular construction and the recycling of the material and so forth is kind of sustainable way of doing things how to bring into the this is our challenge right now so i believe the construction industry uh, together with the professional should take this as a uh, these challenges and opportunity and must go for dr luxury over to you okay thank you very much uh, professor ranjit desanayaka for the fine introduction and you gave an account the give give an introduction to the our discussion today uh, and now i would like to turn to engineer nishank and vijayaratna chief executive officer of chamber of construction industry so actually now we heard some uh, key issues uh, from professor ranjit desanayak mentioning the about the pre covid situation i know as the chamber of construction how much you all were working on these issues the as he rightly pointed out we are in the region we are the second highest uh, construction cost in the country so it's a big problem and on top of that we had various other issues sh sh shortage of uh, labor is a very serious problem so i just would like to ask you to give a detailed account of the pre covid situation of the industry then we, we will go forward to see how it affected in the with the next week uh, how it affected uh, worsen the situation with covid and we can continue our discussion so may i ask you to give us a detailed account of the industry the pre covid situation uh thank you dr laksuri uh, good evening everyone first of all let me uh, thank the civil engineering section of iesl for organizing this uh, webinar on a very important topic uh, really the construction industry suffered uh, Uh, before covid in fact uh, i think it started suffering from some uh, towards end of 2017 because the economy was slowing down and if you look at the gdp growth in 2018 it was 3.2% it dropped to 2.3% in uh, 2019 so with the slackening of uh, economic growth and uh, it was felt somewhat in the construction sector as well then uh, in uh, 2018 october we had that uh, constitutional crisis which lasted for about two months 
uh, during its period, uh, no payments were forthcoming from the government. Then uh, when things uh, came back to normal and country was returning uh, to its normal status, we had this uh, Easter Sunday bomb blast in April 2019, which was a devastating blow and the construction industry suffered very badly. Unfortunately, the government at the time didn't recognize that uh, the bomb blast affected very badly on the construction industry as well. They considered the impacts on other sectors like tourism and some uh, export sectors, but they didn't recognize the impact on the construction industry. Then we had uh, the presidential elections in November 2019, which also slowed down. And then of course, uh, from March, for about two and a half months, we had the COVID-19 lockdown. But really the impacts of COVID we felt, started feeling from uh, somewhere in February because uh, material supplies from China uh, were suspended from the mine February. Now, uh, to have a look at the status of the industry prior to COVID-19, uh, as I said before, due to the slackening of the economy, we had the problem of insufficient workload. Uh, which affected the construction sector very badly. And this was aggravated by uh, foreign contractors competing on unequal grounds with our local contractors and local consultants. Uh, really, the foreign consultants and contractors came for foreign funded projects, which uh, we can't uh, argue much about it. But then uh, when they start competing with our companies, because contractors and consultants to undertake locally funded projects, then it becomes a threat. And uh, the foreign, some of these foreign governments are supporting these foreign contractors uh, to undertake work in our country in various ways like giving uh, soft bank facilities, which uh, will not be available to most of our domestic uh, companies. Then uh, we had the issue of uh, uh, delays in payments because uh, construction sector is very vulnerable for delays in payments. Because if you go through the statistics of bankruptcies, normally in most countries, Construction companies lead the bankruptcy rates because uh, construction is uh, exposed to many variable factors. So, and, and, and apart from that, normal construction sector is uh, uh, on low capital base and high turnover industry. So because of that, it is uh, very important that construction companies get timely payments. Uh, so now, but uh, during the last two years, I would say, there were many delays in payment, especially from the public sector and to a lesser extent from the sector. Now then another issue is in starting up new projects, the delay in planning up first. Uh, this was in fact even uh, mentioned in the manifesto of uh, his Excellency the President, planning approach took as much as one year. So that kind of delays, it is very difficult to attract foreign investments. So if you take a country like Singapore, planning approval could be obtained within two weeks, maximum. So now uh, foreign investors will compare uh, Sri Lanka situation with other countries when they are making investments. So we have to have, make every effort and, every, uh, and with uh, new technologies to improve on 
given the planning approval in would say in maximum three weeks time. Then as uh, uh, Dr. Like I said, uh, our construction cost is uh, second highest in South Asia, next only to Singapore. Now, because of this high cost, again, it's a deterrent to attract investment. Uh, the high costs are uh, due to many factors because uh, one factor is uh, our construction is largely based on imported materials, uh, including cement. Because if you know, even in cement production, uh, about 90% is clinker and most of the clinker is also important. And even uh, it's a heavy fuel cons consuming production, even fuel is based on important, important coal and uh, diesel oil. So because of these high imports, uh, our construction cost has gone up. And one contributory factor is uh, the high cost of taxation on imported items. Now, for example, if you take uh, ceramic tiles, the total cost due to various taxes is about 107%. That means if the PI value is 100, the end product when it leaves the harbor will be 207. Uh, so uh, now I think we have to have a serious look when I say we, the government should have a serious look to find how this concern could, construction cost could be reduced. Then we had the situation uh, of uh, lack of labor. Because our school leavers are very reluctant to join uh, the construction sector after undergoing a vocational training. Even though the uh, starting income of a skilled carpenter or mason would be much higher than the starting salary of a graduate engineer joining a government department. So that there we have to change the mindset of uh, our school leavers and of course their parents to encourage them to join this uh, construction industry. And because there are those who, for those who are industrious enough, there are enough avenues to go up the ladder in their career. Now, because of this reluctance of our youth to get trained in construction skills, the already had been our companies are compelled to import labor. It is estimated that there are over hundred thousand foreign workers already in Sri Lanka. And each of them have to, have to be paid in dollars and uh, the, the income, uh, monthly salaries, one monthly total remuneration is uh, over $400 or $500. So that will be another huge drain on our eager foreign exchange resources. Uh, the, then uh, we, uh, the chamber in uh, in collaboration with the export development board had been trying to promote the export of constructed services uh, to make the make that uh, and uh, foreign exchange earning source but again uh, what we find is the support from the government uh, for the export of constructed services is not good enough uh, in the first place, export of construction services is not recognized as a formal export. Now for formal export, there are various concessions given by the government and the EDB, but uh, the export of construction services do not qualify for them. And one of the biggest problems our companies face in undertaking uh, an overseas project is the bank facilities. Uh, so with greatest difficulty, even if they get the bid bonds or the perform performance bonds, it's extremely difficult for them to get order facilities 
to meet meet the working capital requirements in those countries. So the, that that issue has to be uh, attended by or, or sorted out by the our central bank. Then uh, Dr. Ranjit Desarayaga also mentioned about the problem of uh, sourcing SAM uh, and the cost, high cost. Uh, I would like to add even gravel onto this. Uh, the, 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 again, on this, the chamber has been stressing that GSMB should identify the suitable locations to source, uh, to uh, locate uh, uh, quarries and uh, extract gravel and uh, protect those locations from human settlements. Uh, as regards the sand, the total requirement of sand in Sri Lanka is about 22 million cubic meters per annum. From the river basins, in a sustainable manner, we cannot extract more than 10 million cubic meters. So that means the balance 12 million cubic meters we have to obtain either from uh, crushing rock, that is rock sand, or uh, from uh, uh, offshore sand the after washing and sieving. So I think uh, from rock sand we might be able to get about 4 million cubic meters. So the balance uh, 8 million cubic meters, we had to uh, try and get uh, offshore. And there's, the, there's enough offshore sand and uh, areas have been already identified by uh, NARA and uh, coastal uh, department. Uh, only thing is, uh, this, this total quantity cannot be extracted from one location. So uh, at the moment, uh, Land Reclamation Corporation is uh, extracting sand at Mutrajala. So in addition to that, at least from two other locations, uh, extraction of offshore sand and processing uh, should commence immediately to meet the demand for sand and also reduce the price of sand. Then the other issue, other burning issue is uh, the corruption in the procurement system, which, which has delayed uh, the award of tenders and also discouraged many investors. So, uh, to mitigate this, we have proposed to the government that for every uh, technical evaluation committee uh, for bigger projects, a representative of the chamber to be nominated, I at least as an observer, so that uh, uh, real society will know what is happening inside the uh, thesis and the, eval uh, the contract evaluation process. Uh, regarding uh, measures to overcome some of these issues, I will come up with in the next session. Thank you very much. Over back Over to uh, Dr. Kamal. Okay, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, you gave a very detailed account of the industry and as we could hear, we had been already suffering, industry had been already suffering a lot and you highlighted, highlighted, the, highlighted the key, key issues, key areas uh, we were suffering, especially with the uh, material shortage issue, the, the, because most of the material, major construction material we, we had to import. And then the labor issue. Labor issue, I think, is that we are the only country we sent our female workers abroad and we get down male workers at a higher price to the construction industry. So there are various issues and I think we have also been uh, discussing over the past years, but uh, uh, <clears throat> we are still in the same status. Uh, then <clears throat> uh, I would like to Next, turn to President Engineer Major Anjit Gunatilaka. Has he joined or not? Manjula, is he there or Major Gunatilaka? Otherwise, we'll 
He is not there still. I think yeah. I, okay. Yeah. We'll we we'll shift next. Okay. Right. Okay. Mm. Then uh, I would like to turn to to uh, engineer Rohan Tudave to get an account of the pre-COVID situation as in the as the point of uh, major contractors view. So I think you you as a major contractor in the country uh, have been <laughs> and also as a member in the number of panels uh, you are very well aware of the situation in the country and I would like to get to our view as well. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> uh, good evening. Uh, the stop, sudden stoppage of work uh, leading to long delays uh, was uh, very serious to the construction industry resulting in suspension of work. I imagine a work site having 300 people working and suddenly asking to stop work. Uh, I think this is a very serious matter. Although uh, the, the endemic uh, or the pandemic is beyond the control, uh, but the situation, was, uh, what happened was uh, quite a serious blow to the construction industry. Uh, then, of course, as a result, uh, there is no uh, progress on the site. So there is no way of billing and that will have an impact on the workforce, the staff, uh, the site staff, the head office staff, and also the material suppliers, uh, equipment hirers, etc. So these are some of the uh, things that happen. Then, of course, we can deal with the the contractual requirements because uh, we need to give notice under the conditions of the contract clauses uh, 8.4, 8.5, 8 8.6, where we notice the engineer about the sudden stoppage and the progress delays uh, that we will have on the project. Uh, then, of course, uh, having done that, then after two and a half months, when the situation eased up, we found that the workforce that we had, uh, more than half of it never turned up. And uh, my friend Ms. Sanka was telling there is so much of foreign workers work in the country. So even in our site, there was a limited amount of foreign workers. And fortunately, they were the only ones that turned up uh, immediately when, because some of the other workers who were from various provinces, some of them have gone back to the agriculture or do something else. So that also affected the construction industry. Uh, then, of course, the more important thing is the payment delays. Now, when there are huge payment delays, it has a huge impact to the construction contractor. I think uh, this must be the only country that I know that uh, uh, the contract payment clause is never respected. I really do not know and if there are laws that can make it uh, more realistic and serious, uh, that would be something that uh, all the stakeholders will welcome because it not only applies to the contractor but also all the supply chain. Um, then the uh, plant and machinery because construction consists of uh, manpower or the human resources, then materials, then machinery, uh, money, and then the management or the methodology. So all these uh, five M's are affected as a result of this uh, COVID breakdown. And um, uh, the, as a result of this, uh, in the supply chain, the material production also got halted. And uh, the normal production was not available. And therefore, that also affected in the commencement. So how do we explain to the engineer that uh, these things uh, in what way we could support with documentations, etc. Uh, then of course, uh, there was this uh, health requirement for commencement, which again became uh, an issue because one thing is it had a cost to the contractor. Uh, still, we don't know whether that will be reimbursed or not. And then of course, to get the man Men, to agree, men and women to agree to follow these health requirements. So that's another area that had an impact on the, this thing. And then uh, which is the health and safety. 
and then of course the, the coordination and the cooperation of uh, both their ingress and egress to the site and their transport also became an issue. So these are some of the issues that we face, but uh, we find that uh, I think my colleague and friend Captain will know, I don't think none of the sites have returned to 100%. I think uh, some of the sites are still around 50%. And uh, maybe 60, 70% is the norm. It would take some time for it to reach the levels that was prior to the corona situation, that is up to January or February even. Uh, that's covering the, the, the consequences. Then, of course, the, the path to recovery and the sustainable of the construction industry is what we should now look at. Uh, that is uh, very important because uh, without projects and without uh, funding, uh, it would be impossible to uh, activate the construction industry and uh, the, especially the sustainability. Uh, I would like to make a point here with regard to the human resources, because when you uh, interview some of the school leavers, why they are not joining the industry, the information what we have got is, how do we ensure continuity of this industry? So this is where I would like to address this uh, procurement procedure we are now, of course, I must give a lot of respect to our Secretary Highways, who has worked out a very good scheme, where if there are uh, six projects coming out, and um, or 12 tenderers or 20 tenderers, they say that only one project is given to one bidder. Now, that that is something that should have happened long years ago. It is still only happening in the, uh, the highway and road sector, uh, but not in the other sectors. So that is something because if you have a continuity in industry that every contract has worked, uh, then there is a chance of school leavers joining this industry. And then of course the skills development and other things has to follow. Um, then um, when we come to the socio-economic development of the country, where construction plays a major role, even if you take food and agriculture, uh, we need irrigation. We need food security, that is the food storage. Then we need the transport of the agricultural products. So therefore, everywhere we come, construction comes in. So it is, uh, although some say that it's not a primary industry, which I have argued out and said, no, it is a primary industry, especially bringing the public utilities. If you say public utilities are not a primary industry, then I'm surprised. Um, then, of course, coming to health and education. Now, even health, you need the buildings. Then, uh, today, you need to provide quarters for the staff, nurses, even doctors. Uh, then, education, again, we need buildings and the infrastructure, uh, the grounds, and etc. So, that is also a construction company. Then, we come to the transport sector. Uh, the transport, rail, road, airports, and seaports. All these are involved in construction. And, and there is a lot of scope for that, which I think the government has to find the money. Uh, then, of course, public utilities, which is, I think, is a very essential industry. Without that, people cannot survive. So that also has this program of expansion. Then, of course, we come to the housing, which is also a real need. And housing both public sector and the private sector housing. Then even if you come to industry, manufacturing and services, still the construction industry plays a vital role. They can only kick off if the buildings are there and the roadways are there and the utilities are there. So therefore, there again it comes to. Then of course the research and development. I think that is where Professor Desanayak also touched on module the construction and other things. So. These are the areas uh, uh, that we need to focus. And um, I do not know whether I have answered all what is expected by Dr. Kamal. Thank you. Yes, yes, thank you very much. Uh, you gave a very, uh, hello, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. You gave, a, you added um, further details of this uh, situation. And I think uh, we can go into details in this uh, second round as well. 
the yeah. uh, i think uh, now i would like to turn to captain major kulrat captain kulratne uh, he is also representing a leading construction company in the country maga construction so sir, I, i would like to ask you also you are view also on the current issue as a major contractor oh thank you thank you doc- dr luxury and i should at the outset i should thank uh, i wish to thank isl for organizing this webinar and uh, especially manjula and uh, uh, so if you as i have been told uh pre covid situation in the country uh i think uh, colonel uh, uh engineer colonel nishank vijayaratna dealt in detail about the economy and about the industry and the problems the industry is facing can you can you hear me yes yes we can hear you yeah. we can hear you very yes. well yes, yes. We can hear yeah. you yeah. so uh, as uh, i i i will also add something to what engineer colonel nishank vijayaratna said about the pre covid period uh, the economy of economy of sri lanka is coming down it is actually declining and the gdp growth came down from 6 to 5 5 to 4 and then to 2.7 and uh, <clears throat> there is a saying uh, that the construction industry is the barometer or the bellwether of the economy when the economy does well the industry does well so then the industry due to the downturn of the economic activity in sri lanka the industry also had a lot of problems faced a lot of problems we have we had dearth of work you know not enough work to go around the contractors had insufficient work and therefore the contractors had faced unbridled competition and contractors had to quote low to get jobs and to sustain themselves then we have also had the foreign contractors competing with advantageous position if they brought in equipment uh, without any uh, without any duties and taxes they also brought workmen with them and they also did not pay epf etf only they pay their taxes and added to this i think there was not a there was the wasn't a fair playing field and added to this we had dearth of skilled workmen because as it was said by the previous uh, presenters uh, i think the youth in this country usually don't like to get into this uh, construction work and get into you say if you work in difficult environments and also the people in, who were in the industry also went out seeking better jobs and better payments and uh, so there was also uh, difficulties in getting materials and getting the correct uh, at, at reasonable prices the prices of material like you know the grades soil and uh, other materials the prices went up and there was a lot of uh, you know middlemen who were connected to the politicians in this type of business and there was also payment delays 
and the contractors had to face uh, cash flow problems. And uh, this led to the delays in projects and some contractors made losses and the industry uh, faced a difficult situation uh, even before the advent of COVID. So this was actually, uh, even this uh, uh, terrorist attack that was, that occurred in April 2000, uh, 2019, aggravated the situation. And the, the, the COVID that came in March 2020, I think, put a, I, I should say, dead nail on the coffin of the con construction contractors of this country. So now we have to find ways and means of coming out of it, and which I will, I think, since the previous uh, presenters have dealt with, with this, pro this, uh, this issue at length, so I, I, do, not, I do not expect to uh, say anything further. So I think the contractors need to have continuous work, as quite rightly, it's a wrong to have mentioned about this. There's no continuity of work, and there's no assurance with regard to job security and continuity of employment. So this is one of the major problems with regard to retention of workers, retention of engineers and key staff in projects. So therefore, this also affects the uh, affects the uh, management and uh, efficiency of the construction work in projects. So with that, I would like to hand it over to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you. Yeah, you yeah. give any this on the uh, the what uh, the previous speakers mentioned. Now I think we have got a very good uh, background to the current issue, mostly from the uh, looking from the contractors' view. Now I I would like to listen to a, from a different angle uh, to turn to the our engineer Malit Mendis as the last speaker in the first round. Now, I, I, we all know Engineer Malit Mendes is the only FIDIC accredited, accredited trainer in, the, in Sri Lanka and in this region. So, but uh, also you are wearing number of hats in the industry. But in this discussion, I would like to recognize you as with a concept. So Malit, how, how do you see the, this current situation? Uh, you can start from the pre-COVID situation to the now. Uh, from the point of view of the consultants. Yeah. Right, thank you, uh, Kamal. Um, and thank you for, to the IESL for organizing this. We tend to organize uh, seminars, webinars, lectures on technical matters and training matters and other um, contractual matters, but not really focus on the industry. So I think this is after a long time that we're looking really at the engineering construction industry of this country and having a webinar on the matter to discuss the problems there. Uh, so thank you very much to the Civil Engineering Sectional Committee of IESL. Of course, I am also one of the organizers. Uh, thank you very much for, for the new focus. And it's a very important focus uh, to, because the construction industry is in not good shape uh, for some time. So although I am in the consulting engineering industry, I am very closely related to the construction industry. And I understand some of the problems the construction industry has. Um, the outstanding payments have been uh, delayed payments have been a major issue. Uh, we have not been able to uh, make any headway on finding any legislation that will give relief, uh, longer term relief to the contractors. Uh, mostly because, uh, you know, the government of Sri Lanka is usually the, the defaulter, which is a major problem. And the resistance has come from the government. As you know, several other countries now have uh, statute, statutory adjudication, uh, which makes it easier for a contractor to make a claim uh, stick and get the payment and make it legal that the, the conformity to the decision of the adjudication is stuck to because it becomes a legal matter and not complying with the decision becomes a 
uh, contempt of court. As you know, we do have dispute adjudication boards and dispute boards in the contracts, uh, which has to give a decision within 84 days. And if the decision is not complied with, of course, you can go to arbitration and get a, a summary award from arbitration without opening up the case again. They will award that the DAB decision is enforced. So that rule, that route is available. Uh, few of our contractors seem to use that route uh, to get their payments, and that's a problem. That the lack of uh, I, I, what I see as uh, need contractors need to more what is available in their contracts on these matters. But statutory education is something we should work on in the longer term. Indonesia, Indonesia was the last to implement uh, contracts. Construction Industry Payment and Adjudication Act, which gives makes adjudication statutory and legal. So, which means that if you get an adjudication decision, not complying with it becomes a legal issue. So, payment has to be made if payment has been decided by by adjudication. Otherwise, it it will it will be create, create problems for the employers if they don't make payments. So, those are areas that actually I I believe that the major contractors should work on and try and push. We have been talking about it for a long time, but not made any headway, but this one area where you can, and other countries have understood this. Always there are problems with payments, but we have, must ensure that we have the legislation in place which can fight it and ensure that payment is made. You know, payment, uh, I was a contract for 12 years, so you know, 15 years, so I, I know the, uh, the, the financial constraints and deficits that are in a, in a construction contract, which, we, which means that the contract will require funding for that. Then of course, um, you know, even in the contracts, um, we have adapted contracts from other countries with changes done, which are not fair to contractors, which becomes a major problem. And we should really look at modernizing our, our contract forms so that the contracts are fair and balanced and, you know, uh, uh, favorable towards the construction industry surviving. Our, our domestic construction industry, very important thing. Some of the contracts that we are using here are very one-sided, or what shall I say is, not fair to both parties so which becomes that usually the contractors and construction industries at the receiving end then of course our domestic construction industry does a lot of subcontracts and for that also there are good subcontract forms like in fidic although i'm not marketing fidic here which is available which can be used and adapted by us which makes it fair for sub when you're a subcontractor and we need to modernize our contractual forms to, to conform to what is new in the world and which you know which are becoming more and more fair you'll find the same constraints or, or restrictions put on the contract or you know time bars and things like that are there for the employer also so it's not only one sided where there are time bars so that's what i can see on how to solve some of our problems in a contractual sense because i am in in, uh, I would say, an expert in contracts because I am recognized by FIDIC as a, as a lecturer. And to be a lecturer, you cannot uh, you know, become a lecturer without, unless you know the contracts inside out. So that's very important. But then the continuing volume of work for Sri Lankan contractors is also something we have to ensure that is available and ensure that a large percentage of the work from any contracts given to foreign contractors is allocated to the local domestic construction industry. So that is very important and also ensure that the subcontracts are properly in place, which makes it fair for our domestic construction industry. We have, we have so far not worked, really worked on those things. And of course, when it comes to COVID, now we need to recover and put our construction industry back to where it was or where it should be. <laughs> uh, and that is a very important matter and to be able for them to continue with the same volume of work and you know turnover at the same race that was before uh, March. So to do that, we need to find out what are the costs they have had and in what way can they claim costs. Now, most contracts, whether it's CEDA contracts or FIDIC contracts, force measure is not the way to go. Force measure uh, does not cover for epidemics or, or pandemics any costs involved. Mm -hmm. You get definitely contracts you get the extension of time, but cost is not something that's talked about. Neither under employees' risk. Again, there is no provision for a contractor to make a claim on on the time he was idling uh, due to this epidemic. But definitely it covers costs due to any damages that happened to the to the works. In which case he can make a claim from the employer. But the way for the contractors to go forward is through the changes in law. Uh, provisions in the contract, which is under clause 13, and to make claims through that 
to ensure that they are reimbursed for their cost of overhead costs, their direct whatever costs they had during this closure period, close period, that they can get it back so that they get back to the same uh, without making a loss, uh, get back to the same position. They'll of course have the fact that they can at least get their costs of all their staff and idling uh, machinery and all that uh, as costs back. Then they, they have a chance of getting back into the same position they were there before. Now it's important that the government also looks at it. Of course, a lot of countries legislation has been uh, has been enacted where uh, there is relief for contractors to bring the construction industry back to what it was before uh, COVID-19 uh, curfew and lockdown happens. So changes in law is the provision of the contract should go through to try and make claims, but ensure that notices are given. Uh, one of the problems that we had in the construction industry here, considering I do work in the dispute resolution area, quite a lot in DBs and DABs and DAABs now in the new FIDIC contracts, um, notices are not given of notices of claims. So therefore, uh, as you know, most contracts the notice is not given, uh, the right to a claim is lost. Uh, so it's no use trying to argue about it too much. Very, very simple thing to do, send notices. I hope the whole construction industry in this country has sent notices that they might have a claim due to the closure during uh, the COVID-19 curfew and lockdown. So I, I believe that our aim should be to get the construction industry back to what it was, get the turnovers going again, and therefore give them whatever incentives to build. As you said, we talked about recovery and progress. How we're going to progress further. So having better contracts, having more modern contracts, which are balanced and, and fair to the contractors is something that we should work on. And also the legislation required for possibly statutory adjudication, looking at to give them a, uh, avenue through which they can get their claim and relief satisfied. Uh, so I don't want to take too much time considering I am not in the construction industry directly, but give the contracting uh, construction experts here more time to uh, talk a bit more. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Malit. Uh, you you gave a very good uh, insight into the current issues and especially from the consultants point of view and also you answered some of the <laughs> burning questions the most of the contractors are asking currently with this uh, covid uh, lockdown so we, we uh, yeah we can discuss further in the next round and now with that we complete the first round where we got the uh, very good picture of the issue and there we, I think, uh, as we all heard, we were suffering, industry was suffering even before COVID. Uh, and we, we heard the main issues, the issue with the labor, issue with the uh, unfair competition. Now, we all know it's a big problem. The contractor, the local contractors do not get enough work because of the foreign contractors. And then uh, then the the issue with the the labor actually we all know the, there's a large uh, population of the our young people on the road with three wheelers while we are suffering in the industry without skilled workers so the, the these issues we have been discussing since a long time and then the taxation issues i have also been in some of this uh, discussion during last five eight years but we, you know, we, we attend a number of uh, meetings in the ministries, in the chamber, the Export Development Board Advisory Committee, but <coughs> we, all, we only discuss, but nothing is happening and the industry was suffering, suffering. And then with the COVID, the situation came from bad to worst. So then uh, having uh, discussed the, the situation of the, uh, the construction industry, now we can in the second round, we can uh, discuss about the the way forward, or the, what we can do to recover. Because I think, uh, as uh, one speaker mentioned, now the, though there are negative impacts, the, this can also we can turn into the to make <clears throat> challenge and uh, use the opportunities. Now, for example, now labor, it, we had a big prob labor problem, but now also we find that the larger portion of the foreign workers who were brought back home and uh, most probably if we have a good uh, arrangement for them, we'll be able to engage them in our local projects. 
so with that we can cut down the getting down workers from uh, uh, india bangladesh and nepal as we do now so th these are the issues uh, these are the opportunities uh, as i see so let me now uh, start the second round with uh, coming back to professor ranjit disanayak again i would like to uh, start with a burning question posted to you it came at the very beginning uh, manjula you got a question to professor ranjit disanayak uh, okay. yeah yeah uh, yeah the sir uh yeah, yeah question to professor ranjit from uh, rohit trimavitana uh, i think we locally yeah i will read the question for you uh, i think we locally can manage large scale, large scale res repetitive projects rather than giving giving them for foreign companies examples water supply projects road projects etc funding can get arranged by local banks this results money circulating within the country expert skilled designers we can find locally what is the cur current government tendency for this concept i think you are a former secretary in the <laughs> government and i think you are the right person to answer this question so with that you can we can start the second round professor disanayaka uh, yeah uh, a good question actually uh, i am also personally in this opinion the government is uh, looking for this kind of uh, project in future maybe government uh, for example say uh, in the building development for the office complex likes uh, uh, government would like to come up with the program like the uh, ppp model we are getting the local contractors and investors involvement where the local uh, government will fund and uh, can be with the time uh, they can recover and pay the loan like this <clears throat> and again the government again has decided uh, not to go for the foreign contractors and go for the local contractors as much as possible you know when you go to the implementation uh, when we sometime get the loan for the big projects the situation may be go out of control so in this situation uh, i don't know what might happen but we may have to get negotiate with the donor agencies and so forth and uh, we have to be uh, toward the uh, we have to as a government government is looking forward to protect the local industry about i'm sure that the uh, in future the present government is very much keen to protect the local industry as well as the local contractors and thereby there will lot uh, opportunities for the construction industry time to come any other question dr aksari uh let me uh, explain a little bit about the uh, i think uh, you want to uh, about the way forward so that yes. we yeah. as uh, not like uh, suddenly uh, uh, after the um, covid 19 uh, going for the solution for the construction industry we have to really understand the, where the problems are there then we right now we were talking about the, we have a problem in the material we have the problem in the the uh, labor we have the problem in the the economic situation money is not coming the continuation of the work. we have to thoroughly we have already studies this kind of thing so we have to go for the the sustainable solution so if you do not have the material there are a way out this is not the only country where lack of material around the world uh, this has been uh, identified we have to get the best practices we have to go for the alternative we have to go for the uh, secondary material we are not doing that when we uh, lack of the laborers or the skill laborers we have to train them we have to brand them get them into the board so the, the likewise uh, when there's a uh, not the economy is not uh, we have to make sure arrangement to the local band and various the, the money will be pumped into the construction is a continuous i can remember i was a post graduate student in like 19 95 in japan there was a precision 
suddenly what came to the picture was the lot of construction was started then i was uh, uh, discussing with my professor you are saying that there is a recession in the country why you are doing so many construction in the country he said yes there is a recession so government understand it government is now pumping the money into the construction industry this is where the money will flow everybody is hand so this is how the government should do by the way we don't have a, such a plan we have to understand in this situation how big the industry how important is rakti how many people has been involved we need to go for the sustainable solution to understand in the, our problem material labor and economy and so forth we have to come up with a new model uh, like a ppp so this is what i have to say the way forward for the problem that we have been discussing so far not only the just to give the solution to the what is tomorrow but we have to see the we have seen the problem material we have seen because we uh, uh, engineer nisha explained how much sand we need how much we can get from the river so there is a mismatch between the requirement and the, what you can grab from the river so there we have to go for the alternative so likewise we know the problem but rather than trying to address the sustainable way we try to find out the sudden solution that is not going to be sustainable solution. okay dr dakshiri this is it i have to say okay uh, thank you very much uh, professor ranjit desamayaka yeah there are many opportunities and possibilities as you mentioned i think it's it's for us to uh, work on it and of course the, we need the support of the government and it's a uh, lot of work lot of home work but still it's not an impossibility the then going on this further on the path to recovery and the progress i would like to turn to uh to the ceo cci again engineer nishank vijaradna so can you give us as the chamber of construction the 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 how do you see the the way forward i think there are many uh opportunities the, though we suffered the, there are also challenges which can be turned to our benefit so how do you see the uh, the path to recovery and the, in this conflict here yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lakshri. COVID-19 lockdown was a complete closure of sites from mid-March up to the 25th of May. But even now, as uh, two speakers said, the sites have not come back to normal normal level because most of the workers have either Uh, stuck in uh, agricultural field or started working in some other sectors and not coming to construction sites so uh, in that sense we can say still uh, our construction industry is suffering due to lack of personnel uh, after the lockdown then uh, problems uh, arising during the lockdown period i think uh, mr malit engineer malit man is also mentioned uh, now how to recover the costs during the shutdown now there will be different interpretations of contractual clauses and which may by the engineers on contracts which may result in uh, various uh, disputes and also uh, leading to uh, uh, Arbit adjudication and arbitration and thus delaying the projects further. To uh, construct industry development authority to come up with a guideline on how to treat the claims for cost recovery during uh, the COVID shutdown, so that uh, at least uh, on the government projects. there can be a standard uh, uh, uniform application of the various claims uh, then uh, regarding the burning issues faced by the construction contractors the chamber had made this presentation on uh, delayed payments i think still our construction companies have to get paid uh, something like 60 billion 
on, on work completed uh, on uh, uh, projects undertaken for various uh, state sector organizations. Uh, the recently announced uh, scheme to give, uh, to pay uh, loans at 4% against certified bills, uh, I regret to say still has not materialized. Today I personally checked with five companies and none of them have got this 4% uh, loan against the certified bills. And uh, in a sense, uh, we cannot agree making uh, the contractors and the consultants debtors for a payment that is uh, due from the government. Why should the contractor be further become further debtors? The, I mean, uh, the, what the government should have done is to borrow from the banks and pay the contractors and the consultants and not make them debtors. Now, by this mechanism, uh, the contracts have, all the contracts have taken overdrafts and various facilities from the bank. Now they become further letters, so which we uh, don't agree in principle. Now, of the problem of the cash flow is uh, that will be very crucial uh, because of the difficult times uh, in the industry is going through post COVID. Is uh, the uh, the levying of the retention. So what we have been suggesting is uh, to release the retention against the bank guarantee so that it will improve and it will help the cash flows of the contractors. Rather than keeping the retention uh, up to the end of the contract and releasing uh, uh, once the work is uh, reached the practical completion and full completion. Uh, then uh, regarding uh, the comp unequal competition from foreign contractors, uh, what we have been insisting is that locally funded projects should be reserved for uh, local consultants and local contractors. And uh, of course, uh, uh, the um, uh, foreign funded projects, by this we mean projects with majority foreign funds, uh, be undertaken by the foreign contractors and foreign consultants, but we would like uh, to insist on a certain percentage of the work to be shared with local contractors and local consultants so that uh, our companies can have uh, more uh, work and also can have some level of technology transfer. This we have been suggesting to the government to include as an amendment to the uh, Construct Industrial Development Act. Then regarding the economic situation and the future prospects for work, uh, I'd like to draw attention to the economic forecasts given by the ADB. Uh, ADB is forecasting uh, a negative growth of 6.1% uh, for Sri Lanka in 2020. And for 2021, they are forecasting a positive growth of 4.1% in 2021 from the level we would, we would have gone down by December this year. That means even by December next year, we would be back to normal. I mean, not, we would be not back to what we were in uh, 2019 beginning, it will be about 2% short. So that is the, I mean, uh, to become on par with 2019 January level, it will take us to uh, 2021 mid, middle. So with that scenario, and also uh, government having to pay uh, about $3.8 billion in loan servicing in October and December this year. And uh, for the next two, three years, uh, average $4 billion. Uh, and at present, uh, debt to GDP uh, reaching 90% level. It will be very difficult and the government will have very little space to borrow further for capital development. And also the uh, domestic 
revenue has gone down from 950 billion in uh, 2019 to about maybe 400 billion this year. So the even domestic money will be scarce for capital development. So in this scenario, but then to overcome a recession, one of the time tested uh, measures is to invest on infrastructure development. Now, how do we do that? So for this, I think uh, our government should think out of the box. One way forward which we feel is uh, to pledge the assets we have to attract investors. Now, uh, for example, now we can attract uh, investors to uh, set up uh, power generation plants against power purchase agreements. Now, uh, I can cite the uh, case in Vietnam where they uh, published uh, RFP, RFP uh, to get uh, solar power and their intention was to have about 850 megawatts of solar power and uh, at nine cents uh, per kilowatt hour. But within two years, uh, investors have put up solar plants to a total capacity of 5,000 megawatts. And then uh, the, what the government did was, they negotiated and reduced the uh, tariff rate to seven cents. So in Vietnam, they got 5,000 megawatts of power through a sustainable source at seven cents at no cost to the, uh, no, no capital cost to government. So that is the kind of uh, out of the box thinking that we should have in Sri Lanka. And uh, another uh, case would be, uh, we can attract uh, investor to put up a urea producing factory. Uh, against uh, uh, agreement by the urea, because we import uh, about, I think, uh, three million, uh, three, $300 million of urea per year. Then uh, likewise, uh, uh, we, uh, sometime back, uh, we started as an experiment uh, to put up uh, the secret for personal identification, which has become the Suhurupaya uh, agreement with uh, the government uh, giving uh, 20 year lease for the completed building and uh, contract to get funds from uh, uh, bank against that lease agreement. But ultimately it turned out uh, not viable because at that time uh, the interest, uh, bank interest was too high. That, that was around 18-20% uh, at that time. But now it might be workable because bank interest rates have come down. So uh, the government can put up buildings without uh, overloading the balance sheet by uh, signing up uh, these agreements for the buildings they want to complete uh, on their lands. So that is another way of uh, looking at uh, building projects. Then uh, for infrastructure development, uh, where we can't get uh, investors, the government should be should look at uh, taking soft loans with a grace period of about 12 years, 10 to 12 years, so that we have breathing space, <coughs> the existing loans, and proceed with new, uh, and, and take up the repayment of new loans. Now, uh, a good uh, case in point is uh, the LRT project, uh, where the uh, JICA had uh, pledged to give uh, $1.8 billion at 0.1% uh, interest with a grace period of 12 years. So uh, for 12 years, uh, that is virtually two, and a half to two governments don't have to think of uh, paying back, or so starting back, uh, starting to pay the loan. So that kind of arrangement. Then another measure which we would like is to, to accelerate the ongoing 
load of other projects. Now, if you go through the statistics, uh, our uh, fund utilization of uh, donor funding is low. I mean, uh, percentage I mean, wise is low because uh, uh, our projects are proceeding at a slower pace. Now, if you compare that with Bangladesh, they are the loan utilization much more. So one measure which we can consider is at no cost to the government to reduce the payment cycle. Now, if the uh, interim payments can be certified within two weeks and paid uh, within another two weeks, that means make the cycle one month, the project can be proceeded much faster. So in fact, this was done uh, and at the Southern Express some time back. So that way you can accelerate the ongoing project and have more utilization of the uh, foreign funds. So uh, another measure would be uh, to recommence projects already initiated but stalled due to various obstacles. So one example I can cite is Delhi multimodal hub where funds are available, but due to various problems in the uh, design and uh, procurement, uh, it has stalled. And uh, now the I mean uh, loan has to be renegotiated, but then World Bank has spent funds for that. So the, these are some of the thoughts uh, which we can do, and. Uh, Regarding uh, the labor, labor problem, right now, of course, uh, uh, we don't feel much because uh, construction activities are uh, going at a slow pace. But uh, when uh, things become normal, with maybe with more investment flow, uh, we, we might feel the labor shortage. So one proposal we have made to the government is uh, to recruit youth to either either volunteer force or a similar force and give them a basic uh, non-combat training and skills training. After that, attach them to construction companies on a project basis so that uh, after the project work is over, they come back to the uh, parent unit and have a little uh, further depot training and then uh, send back again to another project. So that way we can attract the youth uh, to the construction sector because they will uh, really come to a government uh, organization rather than uh, join the private sector. So these are some thoughts uh, which I want to give yeah. you. Uh, thank you very much. I back to Dr. Laxivi. Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much. And I think you came up with a number of proposals and which shows that the path to recovery is not with a dead end. I think it's a wide way. We have many opportunities. It's only a matter of using them. And uh, I think uh, it's, it's a mammoth task, but it's not an impossibility, the, especially from the government side. Uh, they we they need to do many things, and I think uh, as the people in the industry, we need to uh, use this opportunity to at least to get done most of these uh, changes we need in the legislation. And uh, of course, you mentioned many, one, one of the interesting you mentioned is the expediting the project. Actually, now it's a very good strategy. Actually, now if you look at uh, in, in the in my case in the project, <laughs> uh, the power. If we can, we, we can save millions of uh, rupees at similar from the yeah. There's a this small sorry. There's a small disturbance. Yeah, uh, it's actually comparison. We need to do how much we need to spend on the uh, to on expediting, and then what is the return we get. And uh, also with the many opportunities, one aspect the the in the path to recovery, uh, to getting more works to local 
contractors actually so you are generation you are very lucky because you were a part of the most of the major infrastructure in the country you built it i, I know we have engineers who were who worked in the building most of the major uh, factories the airports harbors built in this country but unfortunately with time we now and especially our young generation they just watch how the small anicut in the or the culvert in their nearby area is built by a foreign contractor so now i would like to turn to with that background to turn to uh, engineer rohan tudavi now as we see now one good example the uh, the southern highways southern expressway the first part the, 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 sorry southern expressway from colombo matra to colombo built by the uh, the foreign contractors but now get the uh, central highway is built by our own local contractors so why why uh, what making us stop uh, doing these major works I, I think you all in your time you were in, engaged in heavy construction works in this country so why why can't we do that what is the real issue we are facing uh, yes <clears throat> Anyway, the the issue here is both financial and, of course, uh, the construction uh, restraints like acquisition of land, uh, not having that land acquired. Therefore, there were certain delays. But now the main delay is uh, on the payments, which for the last several months no payments have been made. Even now, we are not sure when we will get paid. But I must say, from the local construction industry point of view, uh, there, there are very competent contractors who can handle expressways, and even if they have to go for areas like tunneling, they can always team up with a uh, foreign expert who in tunneling, and then carry on working. And there should be sufficient encouragement from the government to do this heavy construction works. And um, all I know is that, uh, as informed by the highways ministry that even that one per expressway is they are contemplating or thinking that it should be given to locals which we welcome very much uh, then of course there is the uh, section 3 of the uh, candy highway uh, which also at least a part will be subcontracted to the intention of the government is to subcontract to locals uh, then, of course, the uh, Kurunagala Damulla section, I think uh, that is also being worked out in a such a way that uh, there will be a, a local uh, contracting involvement. The technology developments and those uh, long span deals and etc., I think the, the knowledge has been acquired and quality control and etc. has been really good. So, therefore, I don't see any difficulty. Uh, local industry getting involved in heavy construction. Uh, now, of course, um, I would like to mention something here, although directly not in response to your question, that um, uh, to my friend, uh, engineer Malit Mendes, now he's the public representative and a thorough person in the, the conditions of the contract, um, where he mentioned about adjudications. I wonder whether the education decisions could be uh, sort of scheduled and recorded and have it because when there are similar disputes, uh, it can be considered as a decided cases where disputes can be solved uh, uh, easily uh, rather than having to spend a lot of money going through arbitrations and etc. Uh, then also I would like to mention whether CEDA would consider a hybrid of uh, SBD, FIDIC, and also the JCT contracts, because there are useful uh, clauses in JCT contracts, and it would be useful to have a hybrid, which I would like uh, my friend Malik to uh, comment on it. Uh, then, of course, uh, uh, as far as the, the local industry is concerned, uh, they have gone into even uh, such as fisheries harbors, and uh, that uh, not the main harbors, but fisheries harbors. And then they have been involved in uh, airport uh, apron constructions and uh, runway constructions. So it is uh, 
quite uh, this thing that the local industry is geared and willing to uh, invest uh, in plant and machinery to deal with these mega projects. But I think as uh, previous speakers mentioned, it is the contractor's payment that is causing the problem and setting them back in their development and their progress. I don't know if there is anything more you need to need to cover. Yeah, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. If sir. I may come in here to answer Mr. Tudawi's oh, uh, questions, is that would I be okay? Oh, you can take it up, take it up in your turn. Uh, right, I think. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Yes. Then uh, we. I would like to turn to. Uh, Captain Kularadna, yeah, as a major contract again now on the path to recovery. See now the, the the government is also has mentioned about many measures that they are going to adapt now. Uh, the, especially one possibility I see is the getting more work to the local contractors. So they are going to restrict many local works to the local contractors now. Uh, I remember earlier we were enjoying the local contractors were enjoying the this domestic preference scheme. I think in the past few years it was abandoned uh, due to I think the requirements of the various donor agencies. And say if we, if we can get the opportunities for the if the local companies get the enough opportunity enough work, and then what are the other barriers we are facing in the path to recovery in the uh, construction the industry? I think your um, uh, yeah, your mic is muted. I think we can't hear you. Ah, uh, yes. Can you hear now? Can you hear now? Yeah. Now, fine. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, and uh, uh, thank you, Doctor Latsuri. Uh, now, uh, early April we started working, and uh, in order to overcome come out of this covid we prepared a comprehensive health and safety guidelines and also had extensive intensive training programs for our staff and workmen and we sent out core teams out to many projects in the east and north we do about 10 to 12 projects in east and north and in the central province and uh, we started the uh, work by end April. And uh, the biggest challenge that we had to face was how to overcome the overhead cost, overhead cost with distancing and other limitation and government regulations. We also had problems with coordination with the government organizations. But we overcame all that because of our organized plan method of, uh, you know, recommencement of work. So we had to comply with health and safety regulations and also restrictions. And uh, so our, we had to make sure that we, we, we would avoid losses in the preliminary recommencement work so that we have also had to sus sustain the workmen, staff and workmen who could not work during these months. So we had to be creative and also innovative. And uh, we were able to employ lean production systems and methods and banish waste and produce more and more with less and less resources, materials, equipment and labor. And today our main key, the key idea is to bring, have, create more efficiency and productivity and produce more in order to sustain ourselves, avert losses, and also produce for the people who are unable to work and to sustain themselves. 
So in this process, I think we have to plan better. We have to better organize better and produce more and more with less and less resources. Of course, the cash flow management is a serious problem because the payments get delayed. And, uh, uh, and there is also uh, not enough work to go around. And there is no assurance of future work. And uh, uh, therefore, there is quite a bit of uncertainty, but we are certain that the way to emerge from this situation is to improve productivity and produce more and more with less and less resources, employing lean production systems or methods. So I think we have uh, succeeded to a very great extent. The future will be how we, every phase of our construction activity, planning, organizing, and executing, procurement, uh, and all other matters, we have to be very smart, be creative and innovative. So I think uh, the other thing is now for Central Expressway and for Southern Expressway, we are, we are involved. We had to make big investments to procure equipment and other facilities. But the situation, personal situation, is that after this project, if you don't have continuous work, we will have a serious problem of repayment of our loans, what we have borrowed from banks to, to, to procure this equipment. So there is some hope. I think Mr. Rohan Tudave mentioned that Tuvanpura is coming our way. Is going to be given to the local contractors, and we might get local contractors might get some work from Section Three, and also Section Four, which is from Dambulla to from Kurnagar to Dambulla. But there is some sort of uncertainty because the decisions, as we have always seen, the contracts there is a delay in contracts. Uh, award and the, the contractors have to wait maybe wait indefinitely for these projects. If these projects don't, do not come, I think the contractors might not have enough work to go around and there'll be again uh, unbridled competition or stiff competition and the contractors will go down uh, court in law and making losses and other problems. I think uh, I would like to uh, speak about what Engineer Colonel Vijayaratna mentioned about public-private partnership. It's a good, good thing in this country. Good thing if we can make it happen in this country. But the problem is, in this country, the, the government policies are not consistent, and there is no political stability. Now, he, according to him, the, actually, the presently, the interest rates are coming down. It's a good thing. But then, if, you, if we borrow at low interest, when the, when the, if there is, a, again, a difficult time, the interest rates can go up, and we can get into problems with this type of investment, because the government policies are not consistent. And there is always uh, uh, always uh, uh, the, the government governments are not stable. So this is a big issue that we Sri Lankan contractors and investors have to face. So with that, I would like to conclude, but I think uh, COVID has done one good thing because it has opened our mind to new, uh, be creative and be innovative, and also to think of producing, uh, think of, in, 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 improving our efficiency and productivity. That is the only way I think we can, um, you know, sustain ourselves in the future. With that, I would like to conclude. Thank you. Okay, thank you.
fully agree with you. If you are wise enough and act timely, we can make it a blessing in the dark, actually. So there are many opportunities. It's a matter of uh, how we react to it. Uh, and also in the first speaker mentioned about the new models of uh, funding and uh, new business models. The, uh, I think the only thing so far we have not touched upon and also due to various uh, uh, issues with our legislation, I think uh, if you look at final, finalizing a loan takes years. Uh, so if we then again if you look at the 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 other opportunities now our contractors has got work opportunities in other countries like Myanmar but if you look at the problems they issue is getting a bank draft or the paying <laughs> transferring the advance payment so I mean the, 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 we are stuck with issues like that but those are very easily could have been settled and then with that we could have opened a very good uh, opportunity but unfortunately uh, we have been uh, not acting on it um, with the relevant authorities. I think the is uh, we need the in intervention of the finance ministry, treasury, uh, various other organisations. So it's I think the right high time that that uh, we all get together and uh, to start work on it. So then it can be a we can make this a blessing in the dark. And then I would like to turn to the our uh, engineer Malit Mendis as the uh, last speaker in this second term. And uh, the, you can start with the question posed by engineer uh, Rohan Tudawe. And Malit, uh, you in the first uh, round, you touched about the issues with this contract documents and the and uh, and in some of the speakers also mentioned you know the and also mentioned about the using of hybrid documents but uh, what happens sometimes with the lending agencies they sometimes specify that we need to stick to either a document used by them or a, uh, other standard document they specify so how do you think now there are a lot of things to be done in this area also so you can start with the question uh, posed by engineer Rohan Tudavi and give what as a consultant's point of view to, uh, to how to contribute in the the path to recovery. Yeah. Over to you, Malit. Yeah. Okay, thank you. To uh, yeah, answer Mr. Rohan Tudavi, I think the problem we have is not the contract form, but the fact that we are introducing too many particular conditions into our contracts to the extent uh, they are unfair, one-sided, uh, contradicts what is there in the general conditions, and uh, also you know, to the extent where they take a whole uh, clause out, which uh, provides uh, uh, balance in the contracts. Now, one of the examples is the, the take the Red Book, FIDIC Red Book, and then take the SPD2. FIDIC Red Book has that if the employer unfairly makes a claim on a bond of a contractor, and that is their particular for performance security. It says that the employer might have to pay damages to the contractor based on an unfair claim on a bond. Now, SBD2 has completely taken that out. You can see what kind of changes that we are doing without really thinking about. Now, from what I get from banks right now is a lot of employers are making claims on bonds of contractors, especially during the COVID period. There are quite a few claims that have come in and I was told by some of the bankers. Um, so that's a problem. So don't, before you try and make changes to see, you must understand why is there in the first place? What is the underlying principle of this clause? And why do you want that change? I find most contracts have so many particular conditions in, in, input into the contract that it no longer does it look like the original general conditions of contract. So FIDIC usually requests and ask that you do the least possible changes because what has been thought about since the 1950s and brought into being, now you get the 2017 FIDIC contracts, which I believe, now I lecture on that on the Emerald book, which is based on the yellow book to the hydropower project in Nepal during COVID. Uh, so I was kept busy by doing that. So, um, you know, now that is based on the latest in the industry and what is fair to the contractors. The earlier contract was seen as, you know, in a possibly in a in a in a in a in a, in a, in a, in a, in a position of servitude. It 
no longer is. It's very clearly two parties enter into a contract. So it has to be fair. So, you know, adapting 2017 contracts, maybe we don't know about it because it was just out two years ago. Um, uh, we should look at 2017 rather than do hybrid and do the least possible uh, particular conditions which will make it very fair to the, to the, to the contractors. Now, at the moment, I see so many clauses of particular conditions making changes to general conditions. It is no longer the general conditions are applicable. Hmm? So that is something that we got to look at. Then, of course, um, so, so we have to be careful in what we do. So, you know, but definitely we should make contracts that we adapt now. Even now, the SBDs are based on FIDICO, copied from FIDICO, I would say. <laughs> With so many changes we made, which is not fair to the contractors. Now, one of the examples I told you is making unfair claims on bonds, uh, which have been taken out. So, you know, if the employer makes a claim, contractor cannot ask for damages based on that. Uh, so th those are some of the ways that we can do and of course, you know, can cons definitely consider what is best for us and adapt it in such a way and we can make changes to FIDIC contracts in agreement with FIDIC, I guess. So, you know, FIDIC is the most widely used. JCT is used to very little, uh, even less than the NEC contracts. NEC contracts are used in UK, South Africa and Hong Kong. Other than that, NEC contracts are very little used. FIDIC is the most widely used contract. Of course, I, I, I'm not marketing FIDIC, but you know, it's the most widely used contract because the risk allocation is very clear. The most important is risk and responsibility allocations are very clear. They even believe that some of the British uh, constructing, construction companies are failing because the risk allocation is not clear and they don't know where they stand. So those are important. Then we also talked about TPP projects. Now I'm sad to say, and I must bring Mr. Nisanka Vijayaratna's attention also to the matter, even Myanmar has TPP legislation now put in place. We talk about policies, but we have not worked on any PPP legislation for this country, which is set in stone so that you can't go and keep changing it. We, have, we base our PPP investments on contract, on whatever contract we can draw for that project. But that is not the way to go. We must have our PPP basic legislation in place. And we have failed to do that. We've had a PPP unit in place other than uh, promoting PPP and we have miserably failed to do that. Uh, other than that, they have not worked on the PPP legislation at all. So Captain Kurrat, Mr. Rohan Tudave, uh, Major General Nishant Vijarat, I bring your attention. Get our PPP legislation in place. If a country like Myanmar can do it, why can't we? So those are, you know, the thoughts I'd like to, you know, as major contractors and the Chamber of Construction, you should work on these things. Get, you know, look at what the other countries do and work on these things if you're going to make it a better place for our investment on our industry. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Engineer Luxury, can I just respond to Engineer Malik Mendis? Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. No, mainly because of these PPP contracts, the one of the things that I know why it is not working is, let's take the water sector. Now, yeah. the water resource will be given by the water board. But the uh, contractor, maybe design and build contractor will be asked under a PPP to do the treatment plant, supply lines, uh, distribution lines, etc. But then what happens is when he won't sell the water, he has to sell at that subsidized rate, which means it won't work. This is the yeah. problem that we are having in the PPP projects in this country, why it is not popular. Uh, then coming to uh, these conditions of the contract, what has happened, which the CEDA chairman told me, that everything is vetted by the finance ministry. And if they don't like something, they'll say, take it out. So this is actually, there is no fair play in this country. So these are things that we need to address. And I think a body like IESL, uh, along with the other professional related bodies like the architects and the quantity service, should come and take this up very seriously. And also, uh, I strongly uh, request that uh, all these uh, certain adjudication decisions are uh, having a full register and a schedule so that it becomes a data document for future issues where you don't have to go to adjudication because there is a decided case on the matter. So these are a few things that uh, if this seminar can, uh, Demina can um, uh, take it forward yeah. and uh, look forward to a better construction Thank you. If I, if I may answer, um, yeah. uh, you know, uh, a DAB decision will be based on the general conditions and the particular conditions. 
So what is applicable in one contract, which has particular conditions may not be applicable in another contract because you base the DA deviation on the contractual provisions, which are in the general conditions and the particular conditions. So it might not work for like in a case law, you know, like in UK. So that, that's a problem. So setting precedents are very difficult because the particular conditions may be di different. Another thing about a PPP unit is, you know, in other countries where there are PPP units, they are autonomous, independent units. They evaluate it. They don't promote it. They only whatever comes, uh, they may be unsolicited proposals, will be evaluated by the PP unit independently. And that is where we fail because we don't, so like you said, the water project, they, the PP unit should be able to say, no, this won't work. But it doesn't happen here. So we need to make a, an autonomous, independent a PP unit which will go forward with putting the legislation in place so that we know that there's a level playing field and anybody who's coming in to invest knows what, what they have to play with in what kind of play, playing field they have to play in. So that is very clear. At the moment, we leave it to the PPP contract or the concession or whatever you call it. And that can keep changing. That keeps changing all the time. So people are not too sure when they're investing where they're going to come in. So that's one of the problems. And I think the construction industry should look at this and see that the legislation is put in. We can study other countries. What did Myanmar do recently? They obviously adapted from somewhere else on the PPP legislation. The basic legislation has to be put in place. We have not done so. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, I, uh, yeah, yeah I, I think I just would like to mention that we got a person from the finance ministry or the treasury as a resource person and probably could have answered some of the questions. Yeah, today. Yeah, actually, should have been better, yeah. yeah, today actually we have only the engineers here. Now, yeah, that's very true. Now, if you look at the some of the issues you both mentioned, the for example, these contracting modes are decided by the not by the engineers. So the, this is a, now this is a very serious issue. Now, I would just like to get the comments of the from engineer Malit Mendes. Now, for example, now use of EPC and turnkey. Now, I mean, EPC philosophy it says it is to be not to be used where. The, the major component of the work involves civil works, but today, luckily now we have the Emerald Book, book but still uh, in the FIDIC contract, we you go for EPC, turnkey projects. So the, the now we, we all know EPC project contract is generally about 40% higher than a normal measure and pay contract. So these are issues. Now, if you look at who decides this, not the engineers, not by the engineers. Now, some of the major projects we have uh, specified EPC. If you look at the, go to the origin, it's not decided by the engineers, but later you find huge, you are paying huge cost unnecessarily. And uh, so these are issues, I think, as uh, uh, engineer Rohan Tudai mentioned, is the, the duty of the professional bodies to talk on this and to take it up with the relevant authorities to correct at least at this uh, late stage. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If I may Thank answer, you. yes, I mean, I mean, the first few pages of the EPC turnkey contract, if you look at FIDIC, it says not to use it for substantial underground works yeah. where the risks are not known. So yeah. to use it in, a, in an underground works contract, an EPC contract at a higher price because the contract takes more risk mm -hmm. uh, and then find claims coming in is, is difficult. Now the new underground works contract, the Emerald Book, is based on the yellow book with yeah. measurement of uh, excavation and lining works uh, done separately. So it works out very well. Nepal is going to adapt the contract for their hydropower project, which they are doing at the moment. As you know, Nepal has 80,000 megawatts of potential power, but they have only tapped 800 megawatts. So they are working really hard on the hydropower projects. So they are going to adapt this uh, contract for their, for their contracts after this. And that's why I was engaged in lecturing. So yeah, it's important that we use a correct contract for the correct thing, uh, for the correct kind of project. And the other thing, of course, is the independence of the engineer, the engineer, so-called engineer, whether it's an engineering firm with a person in charge or an engineer, most uh, government uh, institutions use an engineer as an employee of the employer, not a consultant separately who, who's supposed to be an independent uh, party who, become, who is neutral in the contract, but that doesn't happen. So that's another problem that we have because of the fact that the engineer is an employee of the employer and not uh, an independent, uh, impartial, neutral party. Yes. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Malit. And now uh, we are coming to the end of the hour allocated time, but we'll take up some of the interesting questions received and we have a large number of questions. 
and uh, I will select some of the relevant ones because some of them uh, we have already discussed and answered. Uh, yeah, there's one question directed to Captain Kulratno, Engineer Rohan Tudai. One of you can answer. Uh, the question is, you prefer government settle your outstanding bills or take loans at interest? <laughs> definitely, definitely, we like the government to settle, you know. <laughs> yes. Yes, there's no way we can take a loan when our margins are so thin. Mm -hmm. And therefore, uh, that, that scheme will not work unless it is uh, for a very short duration, uh, mm -hmm. where government has to raise some funds and pay. If they say that within three months they will pay, then we can use that. But if it is an ongoing contract, it is not feasible at all. Okay, thank you. I hope uh, the is posted by Abdul. I think he's happy with the answer. Uh, then there are the, there's a question. Uh, Sri Lanka has got a two million plus migrant labor force working outside the country. When it comes to import labor to meet the shortage, some of countrymen professionals are against such moves. Don't you think this is some kind of hypocrisy? I think uh, the best person to answer is. CEO, CCI. So would you like to answer this question? <laughs> we can't hear you. I think your mic is muted. Yes. No, what, what, what was the question? Yeah, uh, Sri Lanka has got a 2 million plus migrant labor force working outside the country. When it comes to import labor to meet the shortage, some of countrymen professionals are against such moves. Don't you think this is some kind of hypocrisy? Uh, in the first place, uh, the number of Sri Lankans working abroad is not 2 million. I would say it's uh, under 1 million. I know very, very well about the foreign employment sector. I would say it's about 900,000 to 1 million, not more than that. Mm. Uh, and the uh, bulk of the Sri Lankan workers uh, work, uh, abroad are uh, in the domestic sector, not construction sector. Construct, yeah. Not construction. Because the number in the construction sector, that our total, say, 1 million workers, uh, about 50% uh, or 60% are in domestic sector. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe around 10 other sign service sectors. In the construction sector, per se, maybe about uh, under 10%. Okay. Because uh, basically, uh, our workers are not, not willing to work outdoors in those countries in the Middle East. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, then <clears throat> then uh, there's an, the second question. Uh, corruption in the industry, expedite or slow down the project approval process? Uh, can any of you answer this question? Corruption in the industry, expedite or slow down the project approval process? It can work both ways. Yes, yeah, that's my opinion. Because I know in some countries, mm -hmm. corruption has been institutionalized and mm -hmm. donor funding has been the best yeah. utilization in the, in such, in, in the country. Especially in Africa, I guess. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because even uh, uh, the officials are very keen to get, uh, issue the certificates as uh, early as possible and also. Even project managers are very keen to have the maximum output done on the project so that they get their share. Yeah. And yeah, but in Sri Lanka, I think corruption is a big factor yeah. affecting our progress. Especially uh, it's a biggest negative factor to attract foreign investment because uh, most of the foreign investors will not like to give big commissions. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it is workable on uh, loan funded project we can, because they can add that to the loan. Mm -hmm. But direct investments, they will be very reluctant to give high commissions. Yeah. So that's what I heard. Uh, the It has moved from one digit to two digits, the percentage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, then there's another question on Sri Lanka is heavily dependent on foreign funding for infrastructure projects. Considering current high debt GDP, do you all think Sri Lanka still has capacity for further foreign borrowings. I think that is the 
problem we are facing maybe one of you can answer because the the with the foreign borrowings you need to provide the most in most of the cases almost all cases you need to provide government guarantees that is hovering guarantees now one big problem we face with the the foreign borrowing is the government can't issue new bonds new sovereign guarantees what they do they use the one uh, uh, from a previous loan which has already been served so there is a situation but still i would like to get the opinion of any of you from the panel yeah well uh, if i may answer uh, with the debt to gdp ratio reaching 90% yeah. and projected that it might even reach 100% uh, by 2022 uh, and the ratings rating agencies downgrading sri lanka it will be difficult to attract uh, foreign loans uh, because even uh, for the government to give sovereign guarantees guarantees the space will be very very limited yeah reach almost the uh, reach the ceiling yes point. Yeah. So until un, until some of these loans are settled, it's very difficult. But maybe some countries uh, might uh, give loans uh, without asking for sovereign guarantees. Uh, so such project, such uh, funding might be possible, but definitely for investment project because they are they are returned uh, on the. Uh, just available from the project so such things can be possible yeah uh, first fertilizer manufacturing plant so they they have uh, sale of fertilizer output is guaranteed by a future sales uh, contract mm -hmm. that sort of thing and uh, even power 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 purchase agreements for power generation yeah so things will be possible but uh, say a road project on a foreign uh, loan might be mm. difficult. Yeah. And this is uh, one reason the currently government is promoting other models uh, because of mainly because of the difficulty in uh, absorbing foreign borrowings. Yeah. Then there's I a think, uh, engineer Kamal, I, I can just add to that. Uh, yeah. One of the main reasons why the foreign borrowing is ADB, World Bank and other multilateral agencies the yeah. interest rates are one percent, and then there is a, a you know period where you can uh, delay your capital Great. payment. Yeah. And uh, because of that, only the government goes for forty. And now, where uh, engineer Nisanka mentioned about the light rail, that is yeah. one of the advantages is that uh, it has a very long uh, repayment period, and the interest rate is very small. So that is one of the reasons why they go for foreign loans. And on top of that, twelve year grace period. That's right. Yeah, because they, they are, that is why they are attractive. You get a very low interest, sometimes one percent or less, and a grace period, a long uh, repayment period. But the, uh, all the yeah. if you compare the other uh, commercial loans are in the totally in the opposite. Yeah. So the only disadvantage is there is no opportunity for local contractors. That's right. Yeah. Mostly the only, that's the one of the disadvantage. Unless they are being packaged and sliced. That's right. Which they also they also resist, but. Some of our ministry secretaries have been able to convince them and get yeah. it packaged so that it is eligible for locals That's or right. within the means of the locals. Mm. Yeah, this is something to be addressed at the very high levels because when they uh, fix on a loan facility, so if we can, uh, one thing actually, this providing loans are also again investment for from them. So if you also put our pressure on from our side, they will also try to change. But the, what I see is that we don't do our part. We simply agree whatever they uh, turn to us. Yeah. Uh, then uh, as we are coming to the end, let me take one. There are a number of questions, but I am selecting because some of the questions we have already discussed. Uh, yeah, in Sri Lanka nowadays, local skilled laborers are shortage. Shortage is a major problem. What kind? Of strategy for short out uh, to short out this problem, I think we have discussed already. Then there's a question: Sri Lanka recently approached India, China, and various lending agencies for a debt moratorium. This include uh, this indicates the risk of sovereign debt is real in future. 
this issue may affect the exchange exchange which will cascade to increase in construction materials and cost what measures can be taken to deal in such a scenario would any of you like to answer we have draw more dollars into the country <laughs> yeah so all our dollar income sources have been temporarily yeah then maybe for any fdis yeah. or loans so we have to draw draw foreign currency into the country to keep the uh, foreign currency uh, level stable otherwise there will be uh, Pad pad rate stable, otherwise there will be uh, increases in imports. Yeah, then uh, we have another one. Uh, there will be huge layoff of workforce globally due to COVID nineteen reflection. How about expertises expertises, especially from Sri Lanka community, could be utilized for build back the Sri Lankan economy? Engineer Tudavi, or can you? Well, the problem is uh, the only way I can think is the government will have to invest in the infrastructure, and yeah. uh, they have to get going all the sectors which I previously mentioned, from food and agriculture into housing, education, and all these uh, areas where you keep on generating, and yes. then of course the income also will generate. But yeah. coming to of course the foreign currency thing. we have to encourage our agricultural exports to a very high specification and i think that will never this thing so we need some lot of research and uh, i would say search into going into how we can uh, export this agriculture i mean we have not only agriculture even our horticulture now these things must be explored to a large scale they are going on a very minute scale so if these things can be looked at other than our traditional tea rubber Uh, coconut uh, plantation and then of course our spices so if there is some encouragement can be given for spice industry and we probably have one of the best spices our cinnamon is world's number 1 so yeah. uh, if we can exploit on that i think that is one way we can uh, increase our uh, income from foreign exchange and then of course we can go ahead and uh, continue with our international Uh, loans on multilateral agencies where we get this 40 a period which will not affect because uh, it's a long duration so that's my view yeah then the and even export of uh, certain uh, raw materials uh, with value addition say for example yeah. our graphite is the world best graphite right yes it's a 98% pure crystalline graphite yeah can produce graphene from that now graphene is a high very high value product uh, yeah the future equivalent to oil so if you can do that sort of investment and then we even uh, now we are just uh, exporting uh, uh, these mineral sands so if you can extract the titanium dioxide and waste other chemical from that and export and uh, thereby we can uh, increase our foreign earnings and we are sitting on a huge deposit of uh, phosphate yes and uh, we can we can make super phosphate fertilizer <coughs> and importing so, uh, right on hardly so voi must have a uh, voi must have a research and development section yeah this true yeah <laughs> then the, uh, let me take one more question uh, i think this uh, malit can answer uh, there could be a huge delays in infrastructure projects due to covid 19 how about delays could prevented from becoming a contractual disputes what are the precautions taken by the industries avoid such disputes uh okay what i can see is the main dispute will be the cost involved um, uh, during the period of curfew uh, how that is going to be reimbursed to contractors i mean that will be the first thing of course the outstanding payments over many months is there 
Yeah. Uh, that can be addressed, as I said uh, in my first uh, uh, part of uh, section uh, part I addressed. Uh, the contractual provisions are there, uh, so uh, contractors will have to be uh, vigilant on making their notices and making their claims properly, uh, rather than. So I, I find that some, you know, while a lot of the construction industry of this country, there's little, um, not much knowledge of the contractual provisions as well as the you know, contract management. So we need to improve that, improve that a bit more. We tend to leave it to others to do that or lawyers to do that. So I think uh, the construction industry engineers, uh, construction personnel must understand more about the contractual provisions and also to, uh, to manage the contract. So as far as the losses or costs of the contractors are concerned during the curfew period, there's provision that you can uh, make claims. So uh, that's, that's quite clear under changes in law with the imposition of the curfew during that time. So that's, uh, I think, the uh, part to pursue for a contractor to uh, ensure that, you know, claims are not disputes. Let's get that clear. Claim is a claim. I mean, there were 38 claims in the Columbus South Harbor project there, but there were no disputes because it's sorted out as per the contractual provisions. So there should need to be disputes if, uh, if matters are understood, then things done on time as a procedure and, and, and contractually. Uh, so contractors should make uh, claims uh, as per the provisions in the contract. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I would like to, uh, engineer Lassiri, I would like to ask the question from Malik. What about the sanitation and the personal protection equipment? Because I can tell you that in the hospital sector, uh, when somebody known to me went for a dental filling, uh, he, the filling was only 3,000 rupees, but he was charged 4,500 for a surgeon having the personal protection equipment and the sanitation and the nurse, the assisting nurse having all that. All that was charged to the end user. So my point is, it is the end user you will have to pay. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, when it comes to uh, in the site uh, safety and health, now theoretically you should have had a self self safety and health manual that sets out what are the precautions that you have to take to maintain safety and health. Of course, it includes uh, prevention of epidemics. Uh, but now that epidemic is here, right, it's not prevention anymore. It's uh, prevention of spread. Uh, the, that should be a claimable amount of whatever extra precautions that you have to take to ensure the safety and health of uh, that's outside the what would have been your safety and health uh, manual that would have been applicable in the contract. Uh, now, as you know, the new FIDIC contracts, you have to have, in addition to the program, your safety and health manual submitted to the engineer and, and consent received from him and anything outside that would be claimable. So I think as far as I, I, I see all these items in the construction industry, anything extra that you do to be claimable. Yes. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. I think uh, Manjula is pointing at me. I think yeah, <laughs> too wide. Uh, yeah, uh, we, yeah, it's nice if you could have con continue the discussion. Maybe this is a, uh, Manjula, it's time to think about conducting a second event as well. Because there's a, a very interesting topic and timely topic. And so with that, let me conclude. Uh, first of all, let me thank all the speakers for their valuable time and you contributed a lot and you gave a very clear picture of the issue and what, what are the real issues we are facing and how to uh, way forward. So with your all experience in the industry, I think uh, our listeners, our members could get a very good picture. And I again thank you and would like to uh, hand over to uh, Manjula to do the needful. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, you, very much. thank you, Manjula. Thank you very thank much. You, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, very much. The, yeah. This was personal and uh, all the who joined with this one, there is no doubt that today today uh, our webinar was very effective and we were able to address many areas on the construction industry, especially on this new normal stage. And uh, we strongly believe that the, uh, the institution, which represents more than 20,000 engineers in Sri Lanka, has a big role to address uh, the problems, especially during this difficult time. Uh, and the points that we discussed today, I think uh, we can summarize and direct uh, the authorities of the government of Sri Lanka. Uh, that is with the report being drafted by the Institution of Engineers Sri Lanka. Uh, as Dr. Daksari said, uh, we, this discussion uh, will not be end today. 
uh, we should have to meet time to time and discuss such topics and uh, that is a new i think of the institute of Indian sri lanka as many uh, panelists said and with that uh, with that i would like to thank today panelist uh, first uh, engineer professor ranjit disanayaka chairman of the senior engineer section committee thank you very much sir for your valuable contribution as the chairman and as a panelist and always your guidance is highly appreciated thank you very much uh, to uh, develop, uh, to uh, drive the civil engineer section co uh, committee towards success and engineer dr kamal laksi thank you very much really appreciate your uh, well known knowledge and on the industry and your questions that are will we could un we could understand that you have good and sound knowledge on the industry problems and really appreciate your uh, support given today engineer malid mendis i think you are a very needy person in these days uh, so thank you very much engineer malid mendis uh, for your valuable support engineer rohan tudave uh, sir thank you very much for representing the industry we uh, wish to uh, meet you again with this kind of uh, good uh, thank you for inviting me yeah then uh, uh, engineer nishank vijayaradna thank you sir thank you very much for your valuable presentation and captain kularadna thank you very much sir and yeah. we miss today uh, welcome to rachit gunadelaga uh, but uh, i think i'm sure we will have another discussion such this uh, will should in short period of time and we'll meet again uh, with such uh, valuable discussion thank you again all and yeah, welcome, welcome.